In this tutorial, you'll learn how to paint your first 28mm miniature with beginner techniques. Maybe you've never painted a figure before, or maybe you've been frustrated with your first few attempts. This video will show you how to get started. Hi, I'm Greg with Little Wars TV. For new players entering our hobby, learning how to paint is often considered one of the most intimidating barriers to play. In magazines, on blogs, and even in person, you've probably seen stunning professional quality figures and told yourself you could never reach that level. I'll let you in on a secret. I am not a professional or competition level painter. I'm not even the best painter in my own club. If you're new to this hobby, don't stress yourself out trying to paint like a master. Just focus on mastering the basics in this introductory video and you will be well on your way. So let's pull down the light and get started. You'll want to begin with a clean, well-lit painting table. You need a handful of fine brush sizes, a cup of water, and a palette to wipe excess paint from your brushes. You could use anything as a palette, but I normally just pick a plastic dish. Of course, you'll also need some acrylic paints. There are plenty of brands, and you're welcome to use whatever paint you prefer. Today, I will be using mostly Citadel paint pots with some Vallejo tubes as well. These are 28mm metal Vikings, and today we're going to paint uh, this fearsome looking fellow. This guy looks a little more Saxon than Dane, but that's okay, I'm painting both of those anyway. I like to base my figures on 1 inch metal washers with a dab of super glue, but again, there are guys at our club who use wooden bases, MDF bases, or even thick cardboard. Once the super glue is dry, I'm going to glue some gravel onto the base for texture. Coarse sand, model railroad ballast, or even kitty litter will work. With our figure prepped, we'll begin priming a black undercoat. There are three methods that you could use for priming, and right now I am using the slowest of the three. I'm brushing black paint by hand, because I like the control of a brush. The fastest method would be a rattle can of spray paint, particularly if you're priming large numbers of figures at once. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that I do not recommend spray paint, particularly for a beginner. Spray paint can be difficult to control, and if you're holding it too close or not continuously moving the can, you may get drips or heavy globs of paint that obscure the detail of the miniature. The third method for priming offers the best of both worlds. You get the control of a brush with the speed of spray paint, and that would be with an airbrush. Now, I've been painting miniatures for 20 years, and I don't own an airbrush, so chances are, if you're a beginner, you probably don't either. As you prime your miniature with an old brush, frequently dip into your water mug in order to keep the paint thin. This makes it easier to spread evenly on all the little cracks and recesses of the figure. When the first coat of paint dries, you'll need to paint this textured base. I just hold my figures upside down and use an old large brush to heavily coat the base. This is also a good time to touch up any thin areas that you may have missed on the figure itself. Now we start with the first color, silver. I'm painting all areas of metal, uh, starting with the chainmail. Gently wipe your brush over the raised edges of the chainmail and try to leave some areas of black in the deep recesses of the armor. I'll finish up by painting the sword and the helmet, as well as gently brushing these rivets on the back of the shield. Our first color is now complete. With the metal finished, it's time to pick some historically appropriate colors for the tunic, pants, and cape. When painting historical miniatures, researching the uniforms and colors can kind of be a hobby unto itself. Historians today know quite a bit about the most common colors and dyes used in Saxon England. Natural undyed fabric would have been the most common, and these are tans, browns, and off-whites. For color, vegetable dyes at the time commonly produced yellow and pale blue, with deep red and purple being less common but available to nobles of higher status. Of course, all of these primary colors could have been mixed to form secondary colors, but those would have been even less common. I think this guy has the look of a leader or a noble, so I'm choosing to paint his cape red. It's a bright color that should help him stand out on the table as a heroic captain. I'll brush a nice, even coat to cover the entire cape. You need to be a bit more careful as you move to the top of the cape and avoid other areas. So remember to use your palette to keep the tip of the brush thin and neat. Now we're finished with the cape. 
I'm moving on to the tunic, where I've chosen a more muted, common color for the Dark Ages. This off-white would be an undyed, natural wool color. Next, we'll paint the brown leather straps, including the sword scabbard. Moving farther down the model, I've chosen a pale yellow for the pants, which would have also been a very common vegetable dye color in the period. For the lower leggings, I've chosen an earth tone shade of green for a nice contrast to the pants. I'm going to use this same color as the base tone for the face of the shield. Remember to clean off your brushes with water as you finish each color. Keeping your brushes clean helps to extend their life. I've used many of my brushes for years. I'm using Citadel's Cadian Flesh Tone for the skin. Wipe off any excess paint from your brush for a nice fine point. I know there are some painters who like to start with flesh as their first color, but I prefer to fill in the flesh after my other colors are blocked in. Now I want to come back to this edge that you see around the shield. A lot of people would paint this silver, but wrapping shields in metal was pretty expensive. It was far more common in the Dark Ages to see the edge of shields wrapped in leather. So I've decided to paint a nice, rich brown color between the rivets. Well, this brings me to my least favorite part. Uh, I have to confess, I do not like painting shields. I find it hard, and while I could cheat and apply a shield decal, for this video I'm going to hand paint a cross. I'll start with a heavy black cross like this, but I want to add a little bit more detail. So I'm switching over to my thinnest brush. I actually don't use this brush very often, but I'm going to need it in order to add these pale yellow lines inside the cross. Our next color is Citadel's Brass Scorpion, and I'm applying that to the sword hilt as well as the metal on the bottom of the scabbard and a little bit up here on the top. Finally, I'm going to paint the plume of the helmet with a pale gray-green. Uh, nothing too flashy here. I don't want to detract from the cape. Okay, our Saxon leader has all the base colors complete. Now, let's talk about basing. Personally, I like to use cheap craft paints for my bases because they soak up a lot of paint and I am cheap. These folk art tubes are only a dollar per tube, a fraction of the cost of Citadel or Vallejo and I'm going to use a large old brush to slather on a heavy coat of dark brown. Once again, I am holding the figure upside down and I am putting on this paint thick. Just be careful to avoid the shoes. When the paint dries, we're going to layer on a lighter brown. To do that, I'm using a wide flat brush like this. Wipe most of the paint off the brush first and then gently drag the brush along the textured base. This technique is called dry brushing, because your brush has very little paint on it. Then, I'm going to layer on a third color, this time a, a tan. Again, you want to wipe off most of the paint, and you want to be even more gentle dry brushing this final color. Now let's go back and finish the miniature with some Citadel shades. I'm using a black and a brown shade, and these are very thin, almost watery pigments. Applying this is very easy. I'm going to start with black and just brush it directly onto the armor. I'm covering the chainmail, the helmet, and the sword. I don't water down or mix my shade. I am brushing it on full strength, just occasionally dabbing my brush into my water mug along the way. When the black shade dries, I'll use brown to cover the rest of the figure. I'm covering the flesh, the cape, the shield, all the fabrics, anything I didn't hit with black. You want to allow the shade to sink into the cracks and deep recesses of the miniature, but brush it off the raised areas as best you can. Shade will make all of your colors a little darker, almost dirty looking at times. So when it dries, I'm going back to highlight a few key areas of the miniature, starting with the cape. I'm using the original red color, Citadel's Mephiston Red, but I'm repainting only the raised edges and folds of the cape in order to brighten them up a bit. I'll do that same process for the tunic, looking for any raised areas. I'm also going to highlight areas of the face, hands, and the pants. Now because the cape is such a prominent feature of this model, I'm going to go one step farther and I'm going to do a second highlight with a different, lighter shade of red. I'm carefully applying that only to the raised folds of the cape right around his face. To finish the model, we need to flock the base. 
Uh, here's a collection of some flocks and static grass that I own from a variety of manufacturers. For these models, uh, I've decided to use a dead grass look, so this would be something appropriate for winter or fall. I'm going to use some scenic tufts as well as this Harvest Gold static grass from Woodland Scenics. Just dab some Elmer's glue around the base. Uh, you don't want to cover the entire base in glue, maybe 50 or 60 percent. You still want to see some of that cool texture that we dry brushed earlier. Use a toothpick to spread out the glue, uh, and then I'll rip off a little piece of this scenic tuft grass and I'll stick it on the front right here. Then sprinkle static grass to the rest of the base and tap off any excess. That's it. One model is complete. But what about the rest of your warband? I'll let you in on a little secret. Uh, when I am painting miniatures, I never paint just one figure at a time. I usually paint 28 millimeter miniatures in batches of six to eight figures at once. So while I've been working on the figure you've seen in this tutorial, I've also been painting six other Saxon warriors. I hope you enjoyed sitting down to paint this figure with me. Today's video is part of an introductory series designed to guide new players into the hobby of historical miniature wargaming with our free Viking rules, Raven Feast. If you want to download a free copy of Raven Feast to start skirmishing for the Dark Ages, head to LittleWarsTV.com for your copy.